so Detmar is a full prof professor of computational linguistics at the University of Tübingen. And uh, there he runs a group, research group, on intelligent computer-assisted uh, language learning. And today we will have a talk about linking second language acquisition research and digital language learning. So please, that more floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. I'm currently from the University of Tübingen, but actually there's a connection um, that I realized, but looked up yesterday again, that when I was at Ohio State University, professor, the founder of our department was Ilse Lehiste. So I'm very pleased to be in Tallinn, where she was born uh, 101 years ago, and uh, when I was a professor at OSU, uh, she was still a prominent figure at the department, so I'm very pleased to be here and um, tell you about my research, which links second language acquisition research with digital language learning. So we talked a bit before, what may people be interested in, and I was pleased to see the posters that come later on. Many of the topics I touch on are indeed people are working on here. So let's see, I hope you can get some things out of this computation linguistic view on the second language acquisition mechanisms. So let me start with something where Estonia is way ahead of Germany. Um, in terms of digital educational support, it is the number one uh, in Europe. And um, so you probably know these slogans then from the years past. Um, this is from a news, um, yeah, news uh, journal um, called, um, yeah, we actually have it here, Der Spiegel. But if I ask you, where is this from? What time? Computers in all schools, all students at the computers. This is the program the ministers of education want to realize quickly. Then Germany wasn't quite as ahead as Estonia, but this was already discussed in 1984, right? So if you think about this claim having been around and the neglect of um, yeah, the educational setup in Germany to um, make good on this promise to do this quickly, then you can see that on the one hand, you're very lucky in Estonia that you have managed to get the infrastructure in place. But the interesting question we will turn to is, what are we doing with this, this kind of digital um, context now? So. What's already happening right now, so I'll be mainly focusing on artificial intelligence-based uh, things, so let's talk about what already exists, what already works, and in foreign language education, computers are being used to increase motivation, and that is a drastic difference from when I was studying English, where the only English input was my teacher, and once in a while, you know, if I watch Dutch television with subtitled films, I would get English input, but now you can actually get authentic multimedia material from the target language context in websites, audios, videos, and you get curated learning materials also that are of a quality that really are only possible through the computer, by representing it through the computer. You can also support communication. There's a lot of talk about virtual exchanges now. There's uh, the idea that you can connect kids through WhatsApp. They can exchange messages much easier than if you have to actually travel in a year abroad in the US or something like this. So all this is facilitated by the computer and also mechanical practice. So we'll get to non-mechanical practice in a minute. But the idea is, without modeling who the learner is, how to provide feedback, topics that actually also will be discussed later in the posters, um, this exists already. But basically, computers here only serve a purpose of representing and exchanging information. They don't do actually any work. Are, there's no intelligence there. It's just basically facilitating access to this information. So then, beyond computers as digital materials, that's where we try to work on. And um, what's been quite amazing is last year I was giving a talk on AI and education in Germany in Die Zeit, Zeit für Lehrer, so it's another uh, weekly in Germany, and there were 80 people this year where there were 1,600. So why? Unfortunately, not because my talk was so good last year, but because ChatGPT um, suddenly appeared and people said, what is it, what does it do? Then interestingly enough, then always people put this there and I asked myself, what does this robot standing in front of a chalkboard with interesting formulas have to do with education? And why is it, what does this have to do with AI? So there's a lot of confusion on what AI actually is and what opportunities it provides. Um, and so we will focus here on foreign language education, also academic language education in the native language, and we'll try to make clear what there are a lot of opportunities, but they don't arise from putting robots in front of chalkboards. And that's important to mention because in Germany have been projects where they exactly did this. They put a robot in a, in a lecture hall, and then the students could ask the robot instead of the professor their questions. And I was wondering, mm, <coughs> if the professor is there, why don't they just ask the professor, right? So there's a lot of, it's not just a misconception, it really has drastic consequences if you don't ask, where are you going to put, um, make the difference? So first, what is then AI? 
already there. It has nothing to do with robots. It has to do with imitating abilities that the humans have. Humans need intelligence for some task. To do these with the computers, you need AI. That's the definition. There is a notion of strong AI with Marv Minsky and so on, but um, that's kind of the hardware that it runs on is not the defining characteristics, but the functionality. What can you do with it? So there were traditional approaches since the 50s already. Again, it's not something new. This is you know, where before, long before most of you were born. Um, and, uh, but they were successful already, which is easily forgotten in 1987. So again, where half of you at least were not even born yet, there was, it was already the case that Deep Blue beat the uh, chess world champion Garry Kasparov. And if you look at the newspapers then, they said, oh, this is the end of human uh, dominance in the world. Now computers, if we're lucky, they will keep us as pets. You know, kind of, um, and you know what has happened in the last years? Well, this hasn't happened. Why? Because knowledge that you need to encode in the rules are not widely available and they're not robust to real-life authentic data. At the same time, when I started studying, I started studying at the end of the 80s, everyone talked about distributed parallel processing. But it only was worked in theory. There were machine learning approaches that learn from data. They were successful in very limited domain where lots of data is available, lots of labeled data. You need to know the truth in order to then try to basically replicate it, predict the future based on patterns in the past for what you're trying to get. So you need labeled training data. That was always necessary. But what happened in 2011 was that indeed um, there was the first drastic change in real life authentic things we do in our daily lives. There was the first kind of tool that was widely used, Siri, as a digital assistant, was using a mixture, so there was hybrid. The idea is hybrid, learn what you don't know the rules for, and the rest put in the rules, because don't guess what you know. You know, if you know the regularity, why would you look for it in the data? Just put it in, then you don't need to look at a lot of data. So all these digital systems, dialogue systems in cars, machine translation recommender systems, all of these things are hybrid systems. When you look at their architecture, they have regularities that you put in, what's the possible structure of a dialogue, and they have things that are learned, uh, speech recognition systems and so on. Now comes the drastic change. When people realized, how do we train machine learning systems, they looked at language and said, this is pretty cool. If you take language, it's language is the context of language, not only there's also interaction stuff, but let's collect all this data and let's just predict the next word. Let's mask it, let's make it not seeable by the system, and then you always try to predict the next word. So this kind of self-training of relatively complex deep neural networks, that is the big game changer, where basically language is driving it. Why? Because language, if you think about what do you need to predict the next word, you need morphology, syntax, semantics, discourse, functional pragmatics, cultural aspect, and so on. All of that is encoded in language. So that is a big game changer, uh, but um, to train these deep neural networks, you need billions of parameters need to be set. It's like saying, well, before we can start this lecture, there's not just these 24 little knobs he has to turn, but there's a couple billions, and then, you know, they will be happy when they have one setting. It's like, one setting wins the lottery, okay, let's not change it. And then you look at it, you probe into it, and you ask, why this setting? They say, well, that was one way to win the lottery. But is that the way we want to learn to teach the kids how to get a job? You know, no, it's, it's one setting that happens to work on these billions of parameters. But the idea then is, um, how was it made better, if you can't understand it? Even the people producing these systems don't fully understand it. Um, you understand the structure, but you don't understand how and what it's learning. So then they just pushed the amount of data from one billion words um, of the first GPT model in 2018 to a trillion now. And it's clear I was at a machine learning cluster. I'm a member of a machine learning cluster in Tübing. And uh, there it was clear that this kind of direction doesn't work anymore. We've exhausted the available language that exists in the world in digital form. Right? So it's not possible to just say, well, more data. There's no data, but more data. We need to start thinking. <laughs> We need to start thinking about what kind of um, aspects we put in there. OK, so important thing for the couple of examples I show you is keep in mind that large language models only know about the world through one aspect, namely what is in the language. And everything is in there, basically. Everything that was the worst kind of thing you could ever imagine, you know, Hitler's Mein Kampf, is in there, as everything that's the most beautiful thing you have ever thought of. It's all in there. It all is basically, when you prompt it, you can get it back out. So that means very much kind of radical Wittgenstein, the boundaries of my language are the boundaries of my world. That is exactly true for ChatGPT. Now, what can we already do? There's a couple of examples and then a couple of places where I can show you that there will be limits. 
So it is potentially interesting, no question about it. There's a, a reason that people are interested in something like ChatGPT, and I know that you guys have also been discussing it here, and indeed in the first talk, we saw that also informs um, lexicography work in a very substantial way, or can, for the innovative people. Um, and so the idea is what we will be focusing on is learning activities and solving these learning activities as things that you can generate. So here's an example where a um, colleague of mine, Florian Nuxler, said, pretend to be an English tutor and teach me the difference between past perfect and simple past, and then uh, said, you know, in a nice chatty way, hello, I'd be happy to help you understand the difference between past perfect and simple past, blah, 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 gives me uh, generalizations, give me ex examples, and that looks good, right? It's one way of explaining the use of tenses in English. So where's the limit? If it can put together targeted instruction, in a sense, on language aspect, does it know? Does it have knowledge? Or is it just, in a sense, looking for things which look like they are talking about what I asked about? So it is important to keep in mind it doesn't have knowledge. It can only replicate language that was about the subject. So GPT then often hallucinates. It makes sure the language is good, even if what it talks about is not in line with the real world, because how would it know the difference? You know, think of all the science fiction novels that are in there. Think of all the things that are sayable but not true for the world. So it doesn't know the difference because it doesn't know the world. It only knows the world through the language. That also means that what scientists do, us here, abstractions, linguistic analysis, logical inferences, there are clear limits to what it can do there. And because it's trained on all this data, it has the bias of all this data. So we'll see an example of that in a minute in the educational context. And most important for me is it doesn't know about learners. It doesn't know about the properties, the developmental sequences, about the cognitive, motivational, and all these things are not in language data that it has collected. So why does it matter? Here, let's take a look at this. Um, so uh, we continued and uh, said, well, thanks for the instructions. Can you give me some exercises? And I said, certainly, let's practice using the simple past and past uh, perfect tenses. I'll provide you. Let's actually see if I get that bigger. Um, I'll provide you with a short paragraph that has a few missing verbs. Your task is to fill in the blanks with the correct verb form. Here's the paragraph. Yesterday, Jane, her friend for a coffee. OK, and then it gives me down there the, a couple of verbs. And then we said meet. And what does it say? Great, you've got the first one correct. The simple past tense is used for active, right? Every linguist, you know, even the ones in the, after your intro to linguistics, will tell you that meet is not the past tense of the verb. It's met. So we told it, hey, that's not the past tense. So then it says, apologies for the confusion. You're absolutely right. The correct uh, past form of meet is met. Here's the corrected paragraph with the first verb filled in. Yesterday, Jane met her friend um, Mary for a coffee. Before they each other, Jane, a book, and so on. Then we say, have met. Good job. You've used the past perfect tense correctly for the second verb. Right? And that's what you see. It has problems with abstractions. Why? Well, how many texts are out there talking about past, uh, past tense um, present perfect and so on, making these contrasts, looking at all these forms. There's lots of irregular forms, regular forms and so on. It wasn't trained on this. It was trained on basically getting well-formed language. For it, this difference between have met and had met, you know, two letters. Therefore, the, the kind of way this works, the kind of weighting, the way it has set, doesn't know how to distinguish between this. It may well work, but keep in mind, if it does this now, who gives any kind of guarantee that in a tutorial dialogue where we don't know the difference that are, we are being taught, we will in fact catch when it's right and when it's wrong? Bias can nicely be illustrated here if I say, sorry, these, the next slide will be bigger. Uh, the problem with these screenshots is always I want to show you this is what it looks like, but then it's hard to read. Up here, there's this kind of create a test about social media. C sorry, create a class test. So it's school. Social media is the topic. In Germany, you would then talk about some kind of involved so social debate. And here it says multiple choice questions, true, false questions, and then short answer. Anyone recognize this? Anyone from the US? Well, that's the way you would, in the US, structure a class test. So I didn't say, give me a class test the way you would conduct it in the US. I said, give me a class test. And because of the majority of the material being from a context that is educational, is from an American context, there's a lot of digital material available. It means that the type of instance you get is that, even though you didn't ask for it. Can be good, can be bad. You can say, well, then specify it like the way I would in, do it in Estonia and so on. But you don't always know it. It's the most famous example is with this distribution semantics um, that underlies this in a sense, is kind of if you subtract from king, male, and add female, you get queen, good. 
If you take programmer and you subtract male and you add female, you get, in the corpus, housewife. So now you may ask yourself, while queen is the corresponding female version of king, is housewife the corresponding female version of programmer? That's what is bias, right? And so that means um, you need to be aware that it's in there because it's based on the data that people have written. And that's simply something in the educational context you may be worried about. Okay, now, um, this means it doesn't solve everything, so where can we now dive in and actually try to address more of what we want to do? Important thing for that is you need to consider what concretely we want to facilitate to solve which problems we actually have in education based on which scientific insights, because just because it's AI, it doesn't mean that actually by itself solves something. It must relate to the mechanisms that we know in second language acquisition. So one thing we want to facilitate is interactive tools. Activities, tutorial dialogues, feedback, stepwise towards task completion. Another thing is adaptivity, provide materials at the learner's level by searching or generating them. And AI can do that by analyzing generating language, possibly using ChatGPT, but not only, model learners in data development, and take into account learning goals, as well as analysis and generation of the activities. So input, as well as activities supporting output. So why do we want to do it? Because it turns out we have a lot of individual differences. Individual differences is the topic in second language acquisition research, so not standard teaching for everyone will facilitate learning in the best way. But then how is this grounded in the mechanisms? So I know half of you know this very well, the other half perhaps not, so let's briefly review that we have a rich body of research we can base it on. SLA research goes back to the 60s and was recognized as this independent discipline already in 2000, you know, 23 years ago. There is foundational research, there's instructed SLA, which has been gaining ground. ISLA, there's even now a separate journal and so on. Before it was a bit like, oh, that's the applied side, that's not so interesting. Now people recognize that in instructed SLA, there's also fundamental insights that you can get to. And foreign language teaching is then kind of the realization of what you've discovered in instructed SLA. So the goal is to understand the factors and mechanisms and to make use of them. Both are relevant. So key factors, if we now look through the literature, what have people discussed? And it's a bit like looking at this, uh, you know, 30 years war zone, that everyone competes with everyone for their hypotheses. So what I've done is I've kind of just eclectically collected all the different groups, not claiming that one is better than the other, but, for example, input clearly is important. Probably not the only thing, some people think it is. Well, let's ignore them. the limitations. Noticing is important, and we'll talk about these in detail. Focus on form, practice and feedback, and output and interaction, everyone would agree, are components that are of relevance for acquiring a second language. And individual differences we need to take into account, because if we don't know where learners differ and how then, for example, our feedback should differ, then we're not gaining from the individualized instruction that AI supports. Okay, so first factor. So what I'll be doing is I'll be going through, you can see it up here, I'll be going through input, noticing, practice, interaction, and then we'll conclude. Input is the most traditional form, but it's also quite important because um, everyone agrees that it's an com important component, but the limits of what you can learn incidentally through input alone is a hotly debated issue. But here I take the pragmatic approach of saying, I don't care what the boundaries are, let's just put all the different ingredients on the table. And uh, it's like having a buffet where, uh, you know, uh, will everyone eat desserts, or was the main dish so lovely that, you know, there's all this variety, so I didn't quite get to the desserts, right? Well, at least let's put some desserts also there, and then if you want it, you can get it. And that's kind of the approach here. So um, the idea was that input should be one step more complex than the interlanguage of the learner, so they're still comprehensible. Meaning is there, and complexification is there. Unfortunately, no one ever spelled out what exactly plus one means, <laughs> so it's a bit hard to then implement, but we can try. AI-based stuff, like uh, what Xiaobin Xian and uh, Maria Cinkina and I have been doing, used it in two applications. The first one is more of a prototypical kind of thing. It runs, you can try it out. All of the systems I mentioned are actually running and used in schools. But the first one is a bit more academic, and you'll see why in a sec. This is, you know, Xiaobin Xian, you can see that he's a great advertiser. <laughs> you know, kind of the simple and intelligent way to promote language proficiency. Nice coffee, little iPad, you know. In Germany, this wouldn't work because they still have a book. In uh, Estonia, I guess you can have this. And, um, but anyway, so you click on Go to Analyzer. You put in your text that you've written. 
So this is a text written by a learner. The children had three important traumatic experiences and so on. Written by the learner, you say, analyze. It shows you this, which is basically down here, is it showing you by grade level, second grade, third grade, and so on, grade level of the writing, where you with your writing would be, and that's here kind of in the sixth grade level for something like mean length of class. You can uh, select different kind of comparison domains and say, challenge me on this domain. It's like saying, I want to do some sports. I can do high jump. Let's say high jump, I can do 130. Challenge me. And so then it gives you these texts. And then you say, that's not enough of a challenge. I want something to try something I've never done before. And then we added this challenge level up here. And you can move it to the right and, you know, until you can no longer read the text, basically. And then it re-ranks the text that it finds for you. The source is Newsala. It's a kind of news for English language education website that we crawl and reorganize based on your proficiency level. But kind of this didn't get used much. Why? Well, it's too academic. You know, which kid or p teacher would say, let's choose one out of these 800. We didn't put all of them in there, but in principle, there's 800 complexity indicators people discuss in research. Which one should I use for my next exercise? <laughs> you know, that's not the way these kids work. So you do want adaptive selection. The teacher should parameterize it in the background so that you have overall um, proficiency and what are the linguistic targets. And then the kids should have a say too. They should say, I like sports. The others say, I like hiking. They say, I like reading. The others say, I like traveling, right? So you want different topics. So the idea was then to have a search engine like Google, except for language learning material and that you can specify global level and you can specify the contents, uh, sorry, the language means, so the linguistic constructions. So you type in, for example, climate change, which is something that not just the kids nowadays are interested in, <laughs> but Fridays for Future and so on. And then you can say site, for example, here I said BBC, and how many results you want to rank. Then you get this pretty much immediately, and it shows you that out of the text you collected, in the A1, A2 level, there were nothing, B1, B2 level 34, C1, C2 level 16. And then we said, ah, we're going to discuss, you know, the teacher would say, we're going to discuss phrasal verbs. Phrasal verbs, you need a lot of examples. Um, you can't just give them the rule. Okay, so let's parameterize phrasal verbs. So I opened this here on the left-hand side, said phrasal verbs, lots of them. 48 texts actually contain them, and then re-ranks the results so that the texts on top are not just about your contents, but they are about the language means that you want to enrich. Like in the US, you buy milk, and it says enriched with vitamin D and vitamin A because it's good for you, you don't spend enough time outside. So here it's, you know, this is about climate change because you're interested in it and um, you don't have enough phrasal verbs yet. Hey, take a look at them too. So that's the idea. Then what can you do with the result? You can basically, um, the teacher can send the setting to the children, say, read 10 texts until next week. Or they can prepare, click on a button and then get a Word file which then allows them to get this, and then they can you know, give it to them in paper or discuss it in class. That's kind of the idea, right? So the idea is to facilitate access to material that is more in line with what's on the curriculum and that gives some individual rights, in this case on content, to the student so that not everyone needs to read the same school book. So that's the idea. And it's um, out there. Interestingly enough, many people use it not so much to search, but to analyze what they've done in their own text. So you can upload your own text and then get this kind of thing. Why? Because everyone realizes that you don't just want contents, you want to be salient, uh, to be made salient what you should notice, the phrasal verbs. And you saw that already here, that they were down there, they were green, lay down, end up, and so on, turn out. So can't we separate this part from the searching part? Sure, you can. Why? Because otherwise you just get basic varieties. Adult learners do not pick up everything that's in the input. You only pick up a limited amount of information depending on what your L1 already allows you to distinguish. So Dick Schmidt had the noticing hypothesis, long and light bound, call it incidental focus on form, and the idea is to overcome partial or missing knowledge. So input enhancement, as Mike Sherwood Smith called it is necessary. You can do that, and um, there's two um, ways you could do it. You can visually enhance it or you can functionally enhance it. Ask questions about the passage of the text that contains the language you want them to pay attention to. I won't be showing you that because that's a bit more involved, what kind of questions and so on. Just visual input enhancement, one example. 
look at this text, kind of. The teacher picked it, why? You can see, you know, that's a pretty cool topic, right? For at least a teacher teaching language will think it's cool. You know, cows have regional accents, you read it. But if you read it, you get exposed to English, fine, and some mooing of cows, that's also pretty cool. But then um, you can have a discussion on what are dialects, are these mooing dialects, or would we not call these dialects, and so on, right? So it's motivating. But then just compare, if I ask you, okay, now let's also think about things where we have problems with prepositions and particles. They're very difficult for learners. You need to see lots of them and when are they used. Even we, so I noticed in some of the talks, we make mistakes in the selection of prepositions, even though we are highly fluent speakers. How can you do that here? Well, if I ask you how many prepositions are in here, you'd have a hard time. You'd spend probably five minutes. If I show this to you, it's immediately apparent. They're short, which ones are in there, right? So you see, that's visual input enhancement. And you know, some of the posters out there also use this kind of form more for research purposes, I think. But here it's also for teaching purposes, very useful, because you combine free selection of material with input enhancement of what linguistically is relevant. Also, in early reading, there, is, there are books that people read. And they're limited to these books. Why? Because they have input enhancement. These kids currently start to read. This is German reading. And they start reading by um, looking at um, syllables. So here you can take any text and basically turn it into a um, learning opportunity for beginning readers in different forms. You can parameterize the output in any way. So it's another kind of visual input enhancement. All right, then let's turn to practice, kind of the perhaps biggest area here. Why? Because skill acquisition theory clearly has clearly established, based on things like ACT R, theories from cognitive psychology, that um, there is a need to get from declarative knowledge to the fluent behavior, to automated proceduralized ability. Just like when you drive a car, if you first do it, it takes a lot of attention. Later on, then you can, you can almost still use your mobile phone while, while driving. <laughs> Right. The, the reason you don't do it is because then somebody might maybe run into the road, but shifting all, all that stuff is fully automated. Right? So how do we get that? Well, you need some kind of practice, regular, deliberate practice, and you need feedback to overcome your limited knowledge. OK, so how can kids do that, given that there's a lot of differences? But if I get everyone gets the same homework, what happens? Well, half the kids are bored too easy, half the kids can't do it. Right? So or they're lucky they have a big sister, and the big sister tells them how to do it. So you have massive dependence on educational background of your parents. So it's unfair, and it doesn't allow everyone to acquire what they need to later on succeed in class, when you then have some communicative activity. So how can we avoid that? Well, we developed a tutoring system that basically helps you with homework, the feedbook. We started with this, and I asked, um, because it's a bit problematic working with children, uh, that you need permission from the parents. So what would you do? Well, you ask your son. <laughs> so I asked my son, and he said, can I use this? And then he also did some nice protocol afterwards. I asked, so why did you stop over here? You know, kind of where he wrote this, uh, whatever it is. Um, and he said, well, that's where the line ended. <laughs> right? So the idea of children doing exercises, they have no idea what they're practicing. They just do something, and when I ask them, why did you write this? Well, that's what we always do. Right? So the idea is children, while they do an exercise, do not monitor themselves to, um, with, in regard to the learning target and whether what they're doing is actually stepwise practicing what they're trying to automate. Whereas if you do this electronically, same exercise, then you actually get, um, it's possible to um, immediately, while they work on it, provide feedback. So let me show you two, three examples. Off to Greece again, it's gotten quite cold, but much better than predicted. They predicted four days of rain, but we had beautiful sunshine all along. So, but still, uh, Mr. Lambraki is checking for flights to Greece, and the idea here is minimal content contextualization, um, but then it's a form goal. Up here, you can see uh, it says even for the teacher, this is targeting comparison of adjectives. OK, you've got some input, and now you write the tickets down here. The tickets at Aircon are expensive than at Midair, so you've looked at the information, put it together. In this case, you get um, incidental focus on form on the targeted form here. It says when an adjective has three or more syllables, we form the comparative with more and the superlative with most. This is targeting second language acquisition in gymnasium and gym, academic track school, seventh grade, and we've, we're working with teachers to make sure that this is the terminology they've established. But you may not understand the terminology, so you can click on comparative, and then it gives you 
a kind of explanation. Okay, but that's in a sense a bit boring because it's an exercise that was designed to practice forms. But how about exercises that are designed to use language in context, and then when language problems arise or forms are not mastered, you can provide feedback. So this is now a longer reading passage, a reading task. And down there, Gwyn thinks building school would be great for Gillian because. So it's like asking, why do you think, um, why does Gwyn think that building school would be great for Gillian? And here, this was during the time of Trump, so I figured in English you can do everything grammatically correct if you just always say it's great. <laughs> right? So the idea was well formed language. You know, the kids aren't stupid, they're doing homework, right? Let's get it done. It's great. Should be done, right? It should say perfect, nicely grammatical sentence. But in terms of meaning, it doesn't match. So what does it say? There seems to be important information missing. Let's again, scaffolding with respect to meaning. So that's the idea. And now, what happens? Well, you look. You look there, what could it be up there? Oh, uh, his sister goes there. Okay, so you see that in the second sentence, no need to look further. His sister goes there. Then it says, we're talking about something that happened in the past. Please use the simple past, not the simple present. Right? So it switches. That is truly incidental focus on form where you basically do a meaning-based task in a functional, meaningful way, and then you provide feedback to form. And that's only possible either if you hand-code everything, but <laughs> I think you'd go crazy if you try to hand-code every possible thing they may um, say in this. Some people have tried, and the next edition of the book comes out, and then they have to redo it all over. So you basically need to do that automatically to guide them along. So that's what we do. We offer supportive, immediate feedback, guiding towards understanding, that's not the same as Word, which guides you to write a text correctly. That's not the same thing. It's established that writing a text correctly is doable for native speakers and academics, advanced users, but not for language learners who don't yet know and need the support. So you cannot use Word and grammar checking for this instead. It is automatic. Every new t exercise you put in automatically through the NLP basically then can do this kind of feedback. So it is actually feasible to then do that for a full curriculum, in this case, seventh grade. Is it effective? That's the next important thing. So my first tutoring system I actually did when I was at um, OSU on Portuguese with Luis Amaral. Um, and then we, this was yeah, many years ago, and we unfortunately didn't do one thing. We used it in practice, but we didn't study the learning outcomes. So pre-test, post-test, randomized controlled field studies. So that's what we've been doing. And I was shocked that when we did this and ended in 2019, that actually was the first ever conducted randomized controlled field study with a tutoring system in a German school. Shows you how massively backward it is. We could have done this 20 years ago. And when I now talk to politicians, I actually tell them this is neglect of children. We know now, after this trial, that with an effect size of Cohn's D of 0.56, we actually improve learning outcome just by the particular kind of feedback. So we didn't try feedback versus paper. We tried everyone got the system, and then within class randomization for who got specific feedback on which constructions. Everyone got feedback on meaning, orthography, and so on. So only the specific feedback on, you know, more, for example, comparatives. And that you can do within class, every kid benefits, and you show you get massive 63% higher learning gains on what's actually on the test, right? So the fairness was because everyone benefited just on different constructions. So this is politicians are neglecting what children could be learning in the same amount of time with the same amount of effort. OK, so it's a clear win-win situation. You receive support while you work on it. It's at your level that is attuned to you. There's feedback if you can't do it. And you don't have to rely on your big sister who happens to know English very well but sometimes hangs out with her boyfriend and doesn't want to help her little brother. So teachers also have a reduced burden, so they have a reason for doing it. And they can rely on that differentiation and then work with better students in the class. Why? It's like an orchestra, you know, some people play the first violin, somebody the second, and others have to play bratsche, I don't know what that is, and vi viola. So the idea is um, that you will still remain the first violin, but if everyone practices, then the entire orchestra can play a nicer concert together when the conductor, you know, then shows them how to play music together. That's the idea. And you can be better informed, as we'll see in a second. So researchers, what do we get out of it? It's no longer the case that we do the research and then, ah, yeah, the funding agency wants to us to write this report to the newspaper and transfer is such a pain, right? No, we can actually conduct research in the wild with all the variables there. Motivation, social aspects, teacher impact, parental impact, and so on. It's all there. 
And we then can ask which type of feedback for which kind of learning um, um, subject is actually most effective. We can ask basic research questions in the wild. So different types of feedback, different types of exercises, different types of learning targets can, for different learners, receive different treatments. And for textbook authors, that was also clear. We found some things that kids in seventh grade do just not learn. So get it out of the curriculum, put it elsewhere next year. Right? There's no point in kind of, um, now let's get to this torture topic. I know no one, hardly anyone's going to learn it, but hey, we're going to spend uh, two weeks on it anyways. Right? So the passive, passive seventh grade that pushed it in from eighth grade, it doesn't work for English, German. German learners of English. Okay, so then what else can you get? Remember, ChatGPT knows language, but it doesn't know learners. Do we know, know, know learners? Yes. The learner can look at its learner model, find all the language means on the curriculum, look at it and say, oh, um, <clears throat> I guess I could be doing more stuff that has tenses in there. And here, the simple past irregular verbs, yeah, I did this rap song on all the irregular verbs. I did that a lot, and I could do it quite well. But the regular simple past, I hardly seem to use, and most of the time, I do don't get my ED form correct. Hey, I need to work on that. Then you can click on, hey, help me. Then you get exercises that are targeted adaptively towards practicing at your level what you can't do yet. So that's the idea. And then you can also ask yourself, or you can ask, your parents can ask, let me have a look at this. Why did you do so poorly on the last exercise, um, um, test? Well, conditional clauses type two, we need to recognize that there is a difference between something that is likely to happen or unlikely to happen, conditional type two. So then the tenses are different. So it shows that to you for individual learners. And you can also see what are the problems given a particular activity. For example, we're talking about something that happened in the past, and then it shows you when an expression like when shows and so on. This is the feedback that was given for this exercise, so that's where children still have problems with as a class. Before it was as a learner, a single learner, and this is teacher perspective. And then you can ask yourself, is this activity the right one for me? For my students, for example here, what was so-and-so doing when Gillian was doing something else? You see some images, you're supposed to now put, uh, there's some image prompts, some language prompts, and then you're building, Charlie was buying Arsenal tickets while Gillian was sitting on the bus. You put this together and then you ask yourself, is this three sentences need to be written based on this material? Is this right for my kids? Does it work? And then you get a graph like this that shows you, before you filled out all three things, no one can do it, you know, red dots, but then 18% or 17% of the kids can do it right away. And then when they continue, so this is the number of th things they've entered, the more you continue with feedback, more kids can do it than when wind up not being able to do it at all. Right? So this is developmentally proximal. This is something that with help, they can do it. It's a bus. If you pull your kid behind your little kid, three-year-old, and you try to catch the bus, this is the bus you can still catch with the child walking by him her or herself rather than you know, saying, oh, no, no, or you have to pick them up with kids, you can do it here. There's no shortcuts to learning. OK, so this shows you this activity is developmentally appropriate for this target audience. OK, then next issue. Is practice everything? No. Why? Well, because it's about task-based language teaching. It's about communication. It's not about drill and kill, right? So let's integrate what we're practicing, just like when you play the violin. You're not just playing scales, you're playing what you're going to play in the concert. So you want to get the, the practice connected with what you're trying to do. So that's called task orientation, and you organize the activities into another kind of dashboard which shows you what you want to be able to do. In the class, we'll write our own rules of the class together in two weeks in English. And we now then need comparatives like, I would rather have it that we have more homework because I want to practice, oh, you nerd, and so on. Right? So the idea is you want to facilitate discussion on the school rules. And these are kind of the ingredients you need for that. And this shows you how much you can already do. And then every child can basically step by step make sure they're ready, to, they're prepared to participate in class in two weeks. And they know then why they're practicing. They're not practicing, oh, I guess I have to do comparatives. What they're practicing is, I want to be able to discuss school rules in two weeks. Oh, and I've, look, I've already got my little championship um, uh, ability here on uh, comparative with um, uh, two or more syllables. Ha, I'm pretty good. I'm almost ready. That's the idea. If you now ask yourself, um, does this work? We then, last year, did a randomized controlled trial with um, eight, 850 students and found out that, indeed, 
Um, so this is with a whole team, so I'm, I have to mention all the work I'm presenting, obviously I didn't just do by myself. There's a team of people in empirical education science and computational linguistics that this is, Cora Parisius is an empirical education scientist who was really instrumental in putting this um, randomized controlled field study on the board. It's a full year study. And the idea was, uh, yes, it's effective. You get higher learning gains for task-based dashboards than if you don't have it, in reality. Okay, so then the so last, they're much shorter, don't worry. Um, the last topics I want to touch on is, because I know a lot of you are thinking, you, you guys like you know, lexicography, you like words, How do you, what do you do with words? And on the one hand, vocabulary learning, not all of you, <laughs> I realize you like a lot of things, but um, the, the interesting question was, isn't there something I could show you that may um, be interesting to some people who think about the grammar stuff, and it's kind of, well, not interesting. So with um, Hemant Santiponosame, we said, let's take this task orientation towards vocabulary learning. Because vocabulary learning is you learn the words that are in the book. Why are these words in the book? Well, because they happen to be about toothbrushes and not about soap. <sighs> not a good reason. You know, in English, you need both soap and toothbrushes. So the idea is you pick your text that you want to read, and we guide you into the language material. You want to read Harry Potter? OK, we're going to guide you into cauldron, wand, and wizard, and so on. And we're going to do it effectively using spreading activation and cognitive psychology ideas. So we take the text. And we then process it to automatically derive the structured, semantically organized vocabulary space to organize learning efficiently. Then we or, uh, have, have individual learner models where we pre-activate those words you're likely to know based on your proficiency level. And then we contextualize the learning with the, excess, with the content from the book so that you're learning the word in the sense that is used in the book and not in some kind of senses. So, this is what you get automatically when you take you know, semantic vector representations, like glove or any kind of word embeddings. You can separate, you can find out automatically that talk, say, and tell are semantically related, that these are word families instantiating um, the, um, actually in this case it's just inflection, but we also do word families that um, realize different variants of this content. And then you have things where we used, uh, I learned here it's called GoodEx, I had always called it GDEX, from Adam and, and colleagues, um, where you select these texts from the book. Robert looked at Ned and scowled at a silence. He leaned back against his cushions and scowled at her and so on. And you have to say that scowled, growled, stared, or frowned, all of which were derived from language that was in this. Uh, this is actually um, from um, Sherlock Holmes, a Sherlock Holmes uh, novel that, they, that we used for the example. So you're practicing the vocabulary in the context for which you learn it based on a sequence, and that's what we have here, we organize the words in this net and then take the path using network centrality that allows you to kind of get most out of the words as you first learn wizard and then you learn wand and you learn cauldron, then you've got a semantically meaningful way into the semantic space of the lexical material. So that's the idea. And then you can spread the activation when you get it right, it's green, and when it's wrong, this is fear, this is belief, this is no, and so on. So that's the idea. You support faster, systematic learning of words relevant to the understanding of the book you actually want to read using computational linguistics, which does nothing what a human would, could also do, semantic relations, but just the effort would not be feasible for individualized instruction of the sort. Okay, then, last thing, interaction and output, because a lot of people at this point would be disappointed. They would say, you know, actually on one of the posters it says, spoken language is the primary mode of inter um, interaction of humans. You know, says it in slightly different words, but where is speech, right? So it was your poster, I was just looking, and I said, oh yeah, that's exactly, we need spoken language here. But how can we get it? We need spoken language dialogue interaction. Do we now need robots after all? No, not quite, but what you need is mobile phones. <laughs> so the idea was, we need interaction because zone of proximal development, we need scaffolding, and we want to pr produce output. Why? Because output is the only time we have to commit input, Good enough processing. You don't need all these morphemes. Hey, I get yesterday I did this. Well, that was a thing in the past. Adverb, enough to process. You don't need the irregular forms of past tense. It's enough to decode it, but not to produce it. So, Xiaobin Xian here, that's the name Xiaobin Xian, a postdoc also in Tübingen. He developed an app where you can do different tasks, like ordering things, uh, a table, and uh, finding out when trains leave, and things like that. So the idea is that it says, welcome to the restaurant, and you say, I want to practice a booking a table. And you can speak into it, um, but then you can also type depending on what you want to do. If you have quick thumbs, you type, otherwise you speak. 
Then you know, there's also key language. It gives you the instruction with a little avatar that they've generated automatically to produce their uh, pedagogical script. They also give you a demo. They can give you step-by-step -step scaffolding towards you know, what are things you could say so that you, know, you need input before you can produce output. And then you can produce it yourself. You speak down here. Uh, that's why the, it also says, do you have anything available for tonight? And then it says, yes, we have some tables for and so on, but only after 7 p.m. And if you, again, incidental make errors, you get this kind of feedback. Right? So it's, again, incidental feedback on form based on a task-based context, but spoken language. That's Xiaobin Shen's work. OK, so then let me wrap up so that we have 10 minutes for questions. First thing is, digital tools can support quite a range of things, but only if you do it in relation to SLA research. Input, output, noticing, interaction, feedback. All of these notions are key to ask ourselves, how do we do this? Not what does the tool do, but what can we actually do with our kind of um, insights into SLA? Um, it does require AI methods, but not any, but to analyze and generate language, model learners, activities, and the learning goals, which currently ChatGPT doesn't do, can't do, it doesn't interact, it doesn't know who is a learner, what's learning. And integrating this then into educational practice is something I find highly um, interesting, not just because it hopefully makes the world a slightly better place, but also because it allows to get the research insight into ecologically valid real data about learning rather than being limited to what sometimes is important, lab-based studies, but lab-based studies cannot tell you how all these factors interact. And it's always everything. It's always social, cognitive, SLA insights into sequences are relevant. All these things happen at the same time. You can't just model them independently. You need the interaction effect. All right, thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you for fascinating talk, really, like plenty of opportunities and uh, this uh, digital learning becomes more and more interdisciplinary, so, so many competencies are needed to get one project done, right? Uh, so, do we have uh, questions? Online? Also no questions so far? Uh, but the, what about this feedback uh, project? Is it like, uh, so this is like for learning English, right? Mm -hmm. Germans learning English. And this is integrated into one particular course, uh, or course book. So what is it all about? I think yeah. that, for example, if I have my own application, can I also somehow apply it? Yeah, so it's, it's challenging that exactly that aspect. When we started out, we asked ourselves, we cannot develop a full course, right? And mm -hmm. we want to do a full year study, and these two things are in conflict. If you want to do a full year study in reality, yet, you cannot develop all these materials. And even if you could, these teachers are not going to, for one year, change the way they teach, right? So to go into schools, 15 classes, that was the first study, and to tell them, hey, uh, next year you're going to teach differently, <laughs> the teachers laugh at you, get their coffee, and go their way, right? So the, the idea is, what we did is, we first took an exercise book from an established textbook, and with the publisher agreed that uh, they, um, there was a um, DFG transfer grant where they basically um, collaborated with us in providing us the materials. And uh, then we developed the technology and thereby were able to go into the class where they were using the book. And nothing was changed. The teacher taught exactly as they did before. The only difference was they used an electronic version of the workbook that also existed. But we then were able to test whether different variants of the workbook with feedback on this or that for different students actually had this learning outcome. Then the problem was, of course, well, can't we get separated from the content of the book? Because ultimately then the okay. tech book publisher said, it's nice that you've got these results, but you know the market is divided up. We're not going to make more money by making a product out of this. Hey, so thanks a lot. See you guys. They were nicely also still um, allowing us to use the materials for research but it didn't really develop into a broad scale product. So the next project, then the three more projects um, that then followed up on this and they went then different routes and said, let's develop materials that are independent of a textbook, but focus on the language means that are on the curriculum. It has to be the curriculum because otherwise the kids will say, why should I do exercises that are not on the test? <laughs> and uh, the teachers say, hey, I need to teach the things that are on the curriculum. So, but then that's where also the task orientation arose from. If you think about it, the reason we then had to do task orientation because of two things. It's no longer embedded in the pedagogical context of a textbook, but also the, the teachers say, I want more communicative focus in my mm -hmm. uh, class. I don't want a system to shift the focus to the 
basics that I need to focus on my communication. So then task orientation is exactly the solution to both things. Right. It provides a task context for the learning, which is related to the language means they need to practice, and it allows teachers to say, yes, it's now integrated in a meaningful way. It motivates the children to learn what I want to teach them through the task. And that's exactly in task-based language teaching and learning, that's the idea. You don't want to do drill and kill, and then once you've practiced all your vocabulary, you get to do something, but you have a need, a functional need, a communicative right. need, and then you satisfy that. So that's what we then did. And then we could add, for example, studies now on motivation and on avatars, so gamification, for example, turned out not. So uh, there was a reason I didn't include it here. We had a little avatar that celebrated frantically. You could choose your Yeti and kind of, and or other things, Big Ben, and, but I really enjoyed the Yeti, you may guess why. But so then the idea was that, the, um, that you could watch the Yeti celebrate in different ways when you kind of complete things. So kids loved it. But guess what happened? They, it distracted them, apparently, from the task orientation because they then just played to see the Yeti celebrate. They didn't play to... They played the things that were easy. Not played. They did the exercise on things that were easy. But this gamification aspect distracted from why am I learning this because I want to, in class in two weeks, contribute to the discussion. So there, again, it shows gamification, which is very popular, isn't necessarily a solution. You need to ask yourself, what yeah. are the goals that you're right. celebrating about? Right. So that's kind of, but it's exactly like you say, you need to then look for a context that is functionally appropriate for reality, but also in line with uh, the needs. I just was wondering that this uh, feedback card, it can be really like a kind of separate resources that can be integrated after into other, you know, like resources like uh, games and so on, so that if it's just grammar based, uh, so you just provide mm. the descriptions, how to use superlative for, yeah. so then, then it's not that dependent on task or on, on the type of the text, it's just grammar, grammar thing yeah. in there, right? You actually have, there's another important point in what you're saying, that the first system was a monolithic system that had all these components. You know, there were learners, there were activities, and it was right. all together. And what we, exactly what we're doing now is we found after three projects, that's not feasible. You now need kind of little kind of web services, and there mm -hmm. now indeed is exactly a feedback web service that if you feed it the activities, right. it basically then explores the search space and in relation to a particular curriculum, so it's not independent of the curriculum. The curriculum needs to be fixed, but it's supposed to provide that functionality for right. all activities of that target these language means. So that's exactly the direction we're going, to try to modularize it so that we then have functionality that mm -hmm. is separate, the learner model, the task-based um, dashboard um, that Leona Colling does. And then uh, there's basically different components that have value outside the specific use right. for a particular book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's interesting that you use this uh, word, this verb service, because uh, it seems that this chat GPT and all this IE uh, field, they also go in this direction that they just provide services for particular mm -hmm. uh, 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 target groups, right? So that, for example, if you said that cognitive motivational parameters are not taken uh, into consideration in those big language models, but actually they do try to profile, right? So that... Uh, yeah. yeah, but there's, there's a difference. So in a sense, if you ask yourself, you need to know the pedagogical goal of what, who is going towards. Their profile, in right. a sense, they take into account what you write in the next iteration. But what they don't do is, um, this is kind of very much more like brainstorming way, right? But we have pedagogy is targeting a goal. You know, there are things you want children to learn. You don't just want to adapt. It's kind of like adapting is a 15-year-old hanging out at home saying, oh, you're not feeling well today. No, I don't think I'll go to school. And they say, oh, yeah, go back to bed. That's adapting, <laughs> right? Whereas really what, we <laughs> what we would like is then to say, hey, but there's this cool stuff going on, the theater play in the, your French class. And if you go there, then you figure out when they're actually meeting and then you could participate. You know, it's kind of you look for... Pedagogy is not adapting in this kind of deep neural network kind yeah. of way to support interaction, mm -hmm. alignment. Mm -hmm. It is um, being adaptive towards the learning goal so that you take people along. Mm -hmm. And they're not doing that. Also not like we're testing in another project, little uh, video game. Mm -hmm. And the idea is with this little video game, we test, they play one, two minute, and they're little um, animals that hide, and then you need to find them. And then we know their current working memory capacity. And then in the learner model, we can say, hey, when they can really focus well, then I give them the harder things, and when they're kind of a bit tired, so intra-individual working memory capacity is an, another project that we're trying. Yes, yes. Like, um, yeah. Yes, please, Maria Maren. Uh, thank you. Very fascinating. Is it possible to learn German with this method? Because uh, English is a, it seems that English is a target language. Can be a German target language. As a parent, perhaps, it, 
if there is a, such a nice method, I would suggest my child to learn German as a second language, uh -huh. not English. Yeah, thanks a lot. Because in the beginning, indeed, we, we start with Portuguese, then English as a foreign language. And then hanging out with lots of SLA researchers. And then in Germany, there is actually quite an educational disaster that in elementary school, uh, a highly substantial number of children do not learn how to read properly and cannot even um, pr process um, academic language, third, fourth grade, that is part of the instruction in the classroom. So then um, talking with a range of people, um, uh, Michael Becker-Motzek and, and others working on German um, as an academic language, Deutsche Bildungssprache, then the idea was what can we do about it? And I uh, learned in the last five, six years that basically this indeed is very much applicable what we show there, for example, input enhancement. One project that we have there with the Deutsche Institut for Erwachsenenbildung, so German Institute for Adult um, Education, which teach lit literacy, cl literacy classes in German. Uh, there we also have a system called Kansas uh, that is like Flair, except that it tries to find, it has a corpus underlying, because otherwise you don't find enough very beginner texts. And so you need, for different target audiences, you can still do input, provision, you can do input enhancement, enrichment, you can still do all the things we're doing there, but you then need um, to adapt the kind of materials you find to what may be in the range of these audiences. And for German, indeed, Flair also works for German. Our linguistic complexity analysis works for German with 800 me measures. Um, and uh, so we also now work in English language, German language, and then uh, complexity we do for French, Italian, Spanish. Uh, there's a group, Mikel uh, Irosqueta, working on Basque. Um, and so, um, you know, and then here there's uh, Kaidi Lu, for example, who has done work on linguistic complexity analysis of um, Estonian, which one could plug into such systems directly and then do right. this adaptivity on those kind of measures. Right, right. Can you imagine 800 measures? <laughs> well, you we can build on Kaidi's Ka work. Like a long way done. to go. <laughs> <laughs> We're definitely with Estonian, we just <laughs> have to jump into this. <laughs> okay, Sivan, yes, please. Just last uh, question. I was uh, wondering one. Uh, issue because of our situation so in Slovenia um, so when you <coughs> take text from let's say from the internet or from uh, anywhere uh, maybe even in real time to create uh, to create uh, well, the exercises and such so what is the copyright status there uh, I mean in the sense that uh, I mean, is it, is it allowed to use any material in schools for education? And what happens if, um, I don't know, a company then takes your academic project, which would be less problematic from copyright status, uh, I guess, and just makes it into their um, own system, mm. which are sold to, I guess. Yeah. It's a very good um, question, because indeed, after we had completed the first project, I went to the different publishers in Germany, Klett, and, and the, for all these CEOs. And what was interesting is one of them actually, um, Angela Bleisteiner, the CEO of Klett, she said, oh, cool, let's, let's try this input enhancement method in Flair. Um, and then the lawyers uh, that uh, this, uh, they have told her, too dangerous. Um, for not gaining much economic ground, the legal potential challenges we may face in enhancing material for the user, if she can, for example, look at Die Zeit, you know, German newspaper, then that's, you know, legal, you know, she, um, let's assume you do it legally. <laughs> then if I enhance it, I change in her system, in her browser, then it remains legal. But what exactly if then there's an intermediary who sells the enhancement of Die Zeit to her, and they don't pay the site for all the different users. So there are some um, challenges. But what I found is also that um, there's another publisher called Spotlight. They put out magazines, uh, Spotlight, for different languages. Um, they put out um, material that is attuned, that's current topics, but also attuned to the in complexity, especially written so that it's likely to be uh, consumable by learners. And these kind of publishers, for example, I think are, they were very welcoming with um, pr providing us all their um, past publications to be able to train these models, you know, the uh, machine learning models built on these 800 complexity indicators. And um, they also then, um, I'm looking forward to talking to them again because they gain something out of it, right? We index their, all their material in terms of a new audience that then will find it attractive to read these texts and thereby 
make ex provide access to something that otherwise just would be sitting there to few subscribers. So you, I think, need to overcome the hurdle of the dangers of not um, of the copyright holders must benefit. And the same Deutsche Welle is another um, yeah, um, broadcasting station in Germany. And with Goethe Institute, we are now right now negotiating. They have beautiful material. And we're trying to find a way that if they search through our systems and get the texts that, they, that are relevant to them in terms of language, that they still get the clicks, that we basically then still give them the visibility because they're, of course, f afraid that if they only people access their materials through us, then they lose visibility that they're the actual provider. So those are challenges, but I think they can be overcome because what we do is we provide them access in a new way. Just, just very short yes, question. Very short. It will be very short. So, uh, <clears throat> as a provocation, let's imagine that we simply generate corpora for what you uh, what you need f uh, with ChatGPT or whichever model. So, would you think about something like that or not? Yeah. Uh, or not uh, yeah. to to get rid of the copyright problem? Well, so the copyright, I would say first. The copyright problems, it's, I'm a scientist, I just make things work. Um, so I uh, don't, the, the rest is the legal department, they should worry about it. Um, but kind of the, uh, I still want to make it realizable in practice and what you're saying is, I think is very attractive in regard to there's lack of materials at lower levels of complexity on the internet. So we've done, a, um, we've spent years trying to collect, you know, a corpus with 21,000 or so documents, that, but it's not on very topics and so on. So how can you match the interests of the learners or the, yeah, any kind of learners, young learners, old learners, it differs what they're interested in with the language that packages this information in different ways. And I think the way to go indeed is to generate them, not so much because of the copyright, but because it allows you to combine meaning and form in a way that the form is incrementally complexifying, but the meaning is in line with what, what motivates you to read this text. So I think that is indeed something that in the future is the way to go for the simple text. Otherwise, authentic human written texts are just the gold standard. <coughs> Right. Thank you very much for this really fascinating talk, and uh, this Thank is you. our present for you. Yeah. Thank you. And now we have uh, lunch for.